Good morning. So on behalf of the M Health Planning Committee, I want to welcome you to day two of the summit. I hope that day one was both interesting and productive for you. It's my pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. Peter Tippett is the Chief Medical Officer and Vice President of Verizon Enterprise Solutions Health IT Practice. Dr. Tippett also leads the Verizon Innovation Incubator, which helps Verizon bring innovative services and technologies to the market. Dr. Tippett has a long and distinguished career in the IT sector, particularly in data security. He created the first commercial antivirus product, which we now know as the Norton Antivirus. He also pioneered a number of common technologies, including one for which I am eternally grateful for the undo application function. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Tippett. Well, good morning, everybody. This is, uh, I've heard that uh, there one or two of you were out late last night, so anybody late last night? I'd like to uh, just show you a quick video to get things started, and then I'll just come right back in and give you a, get to get us set up. So when we were setting up for this uh, talk today, we kept coming up with more and more numbers. And uh, at one point, we had a slide with you know, 45 or 50 different numbers on it. And at some point, the graphics people said, you can't do that to the audience. We kept making the font smaller and smaller. 10 years ago, I was part of the PTEC, the President's Information Technology Advisory Committee. And we, uh, at, at that time, we decided, that, you know, Bush was wondering how to bend the cost curve on medicine, you know, nothing new about that. We were trying to figure out what, what would technology make a play there. And we spent a couple of years subpoenaing people and doing the research and figuring these things out. And we came up and decided, ultimately published a report, and it fundamentally said, you know, if we get healthcare to do IT the way finance does IT, only three things will happen. One, we'll have everybody be healthier. Two, costs will go down dramatically. And three, we'll have an entirely new kind of science. But other than that, it's probably not worth doing. Now, it turns out we have tons and tons of numbers that, that give us evidence for this stuff. You know, Institute of Medicine just a month or two ago published a, a, a study that showed more than $700 billion of available savings in many different categories. Some of them efficiency, some of them fraud oriented. Verizon has a very strong fraud management program that isn't about pay and chase, it's about real time figuring out which submissions to which uh, insurers or payers are fraudulent so you don't have to pay the bill in the first place. But we have all kinds of numbers and this conference, rather than my telling you these numbers, 
I thought we'd just uh, uh, jump right into the sort of basics of what we might try and do about those numbers. Last year, we were here telling you what Verizon is thinking about doing and what we're starting to do and what we imagine doing. And today, I'd like to get you a little more along the pathway to what's actually happening. I think most people know this set of numbers about chronic disease. Uh, the, a dramatic portion of all costs in medicine is organized around just four or five of the chronic diseases. And if you talk about the Medicare population, that's pushing 90%. But you know, we need to do the basics of fixing health care. And I, I call the, the uh, transition that we're in now big slow-mo clo. If you want to write that down, it's going to be tested later. Big for big data, so for social, mo for mobile, and clo for cloud. Big slow-mo cloud. We had this revolution that started in the mainframe era, and then we had the PC era, and then we had the internet era, and now we have the big SOMOCLO era. And it seems to me that as we have this transformation in healthcare, we're going to wind up with a lot of disintermediation, just like what happened in you know, travel agencies or banking or any of these other industries. And you're all part of making that stuff happen. And what Verizon's trying to do, what our main goal is, 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 of course, we're good at networking, and of course, we're good at mobility. But we really want to raise up another notch. Our, our CEO calls it uh, you know, finding a higher gear. We want to find our higher gear to see if we can enable all of you and everybody else who's innovating in healthcare to remove the friction and reduce that. Obviously, we need to control costs. We need to improve quality. We need to improve access, and we need to simplify compliance. But one of the things we're really interested in is figuring out what is it that's holding us back from making these transformations, and what can we do at Verizon that can accelerate all that for you. I came to Verizon uh, almost five years ago. I brought a, uh, 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 I was a founder of a company called CyberTrust, uh, and so I came to Verizon. And I wasn't uh, aware, even though I'm a techie kind of a guy in my history, that Verizon really runs most of the worldwide internet. Uh, we, UUNet and MCI were the, back, the main initial backbones of the worldwide net. And today, more than 70% of the traffic going from anywhere in the world to anywhere else in the world goes through something that Verizon owns or manages. So we run a huge part of the backbone of the internet, not just in America, but in the rest of the world. Gardner makes uh, a lot of uh, quadrants, and uh, we're relatively proud of the fact that in the security and managed security services quadrant, Verizon is in the far upper right uh, corner every year for, I think it's four or five years running now. And that's because we do a huge amount of work to help enterprises become more secure. But it's not just about security. It's about compliance with regulations. And I'll, I'll come back to that in, in a minute. Uh, I, I, does anybody here not heard about Verizon's 4G LTE network being bigger than all other networks uh, combined? I could spend a half an hour and tell you about that if you'd like, but I'm pretty sure you realize that high speed, high reliability, high uh, uh, throughput, low latency, and real pervasiveness matters. And as we move to, uh, to more and more driving healthcare out to the edges and we get that space between when you know it's it's the 99 and a half or 99.93 or 99.88 where people aren't in front of a doctor where uh, the vast majority of healthcare happens and we need to be able to intervene in those times as well and getting the network to operate and getting people to be able to interact you know that that's that's key as we move forward in Verizon we're interested in these other kinds of things that can enable and and clearly dealing with the big data portion, dealing with the cloud compute revolution is a, is a big thing. We brought out a, uh, a uh, we bought Terramark a year and a half or two ago, which is all about high end, high security, high compliance, super duper, ultra top secret uh, data centers. And we figured out that if we could get the government and top secret to work, we could probably get HIPAA to work. <laughs> and it turns out we made that happen. And, uh, and now we have uh, Terramark and 50 other uh, data centers run by that whole team, all integrated with the security and compliance uh, groups. You can see we've got uh, mobile cloud things. Uh, and one of our most rec recent acquisitions is Hughes Telematics. Uh, I was in a Mercedes the other day, and I uh, uh, pushed a button on the mirror. 
uh, and somebody entered, you know, the car kind of started making uh, very high fidelity discussion with me and somebody said, can I help you? <laughs> and it was, uh, is there an emergency? I don't know if any of you pushed the button on some of these things, but, but telematics in part is about pushing a button and getting emergency help. It's also about instrumenting the car and, and using accelerometers to figure out if you've been in an accident or helping you unlock or, or tracking the maintenance schedules and things like that. But if you imagine taking telematics as it works in a car and applying it to something much, much smaller, our Hughes division has made a watch. And if you want to zoom in a little bit, I'm going to hold this near my chest so you can hear. You are being connected to the emergency response center. I could actually connect to the emergency response center, but that'll talk another four or five minutes, and we got to tell them it wasn't really an emergency, et cetera. But this little watch, you know, when I was a kid, was a Dick Tracy watch. Uh, what can you do with something like this? Well, obviously, pushing the button when you need help works, and a lot of people might find that interesting. But it's also interesting to put the modern things in things like this. So something like uh, an accelerometer that can tell whether you've fallen or not. Turns out telling whether you've fallen isn't easy. Uh, and so we've got some innovation in here that can tell the difference between shaking your arm and shaking your arm and falling. Uh, we can tell, help people that wander figure out whether, where, where they are right now. Uh, so these things can be customized and organized to be part of, of applications that get installed in hospitals or nursing homes or even care at home where you're worried about the Alzheimer's wanderer uh, or the faller. Uh, and if you fall and you don't answer, we, we, we'll have some discussion about that in a minute. So, I think everybody knows that connectivity is interesting to somebody like Verizon, and we're good at it. I think it would be a natural inclination for people to think that uh, hosting uh, makes sense to somebody like Verizon, and we're good at it. A couple of months ago, we brought out a combination of things where we, we made it so that if you use our Terramark uh, data centers, whether that's for co-location or managed hosting, or even click, 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 and get yourself 100 servers of cloud computing, we will sign the BAA for that. It turned out that people haven't done that. It turns out that healthcare is dead last among industry sectors that use cloud computing. And it isn't because healthcare doesn't want innovation. It isn't because healthcare is not interested in bleeding edge technologies. There's more bleeding edge technologies in healthcare than almost anywhere else. You know, you can swallow a pill and get a video of your intestines. But we're dead last when it comes to the use of information technology to drive our businesses. And part of the reason we think for that is the, is the regulatory overhang. So to the extent that we can provide ways to remove or re reduce that work, to re remove the friction or reduce the friction and make it easy, uh, we, we, we think that even in hosting and cloud computing, having an ability to do HIPAA compliance matters. This is our notion, the next layer up, uh, I've got labeled exchanges. And Exchanges has all kinds of words. We talk about NHIN Connect and, and NHIN Direct and all these other things. In healthcare, we've got labels for it. But in Verizon, we're interested in the notion of exchanges in part as a thing that just removes from you a lot of the worry about compliance. You know, if you're trying to, you know, I was in a hospital a couple of months ago where the CIO was telling me that she had to fire a nurse. And she fired the nurse because the doctor uh, had left the intensive care unit and a person on a ventilator was crashing and the nurse got a blood gas and ran the test. The doctor had gone to take care of a code elsewhere in the hospital. The nurse took a photograph with her cell phone of the blood gas test results and texted the result to the doctor on the other side of the hospital. The doctor, if you've ever seen a blood gas and you've ever done this, there's mental gymnastics that go on. It's much easier to deal with if you're looking at the numbers than if you uh, do it any other way. Doctor read back some quick uh, adjustments. Both patients lived, but the nurse violated HIPAA and was fired because it was her third time. My sense about that is why don't we make it so that text is legal? Not by changing the law, but why don't we embrace privacy and security? Why don't we make it so that, you know, doctors, you know, it, we, we have these ads about people doing video with each other or, or whatnot. If you want to talk to your sister about your diabetes, feel free. But if you want to talk to your doctor about your diabetes, it's illegal unless the whole thing is HIPAA compliant. 
this is important. We brought this on ourselves. We wanted to be HIPAA compliant. We want to worry about privacy and security. So at Verizon, what we want to do is embrace the whole notion of privacy and security, go beyond, uh, above and beyond, make it possible so that uh, the, if you use an exchange like the medical data exchange that we launched a, a little over a year ago, you don't need to worry about compliance. That's my problem. Why don't I give you a directory, and you don't need to worry about how to get it to the next person. Let that be my problem. Why don't I give you strong identity? I'll talk about that in a moment. And let that be my problem. Let me help you figure out who it is that you're sending this to. Let me help you figure out which John Smith is which John Smith and which Dr. Jones is which Dr. Jones. Let's, let's, those are hard problems that take real scale and need to operate at national and international levels. It turns out that, uh, that identity is something that Verizon's pretty good at. Uh, we uh, uh, make these little, uh, in, in, in 25 countries in the world, we run an identity card. This is uh, one that will get you uh, into many federal things. It's a, a PIV card or a CAC card. Uh, but in Belgium and Hong Kong and Singapore and Malaysia and so on, we run the back-end infrastructure for identity through our cyber trust uh, group and the PKI for all of that. But imagine if we could make that dramatically cheaper, dramatically stronger, dramatically easier, and make it so that it's pervasive and easily consumable. Make, make that as an infrastructure that can raise all boats and all of healthcare. I'll show you about that in a moment. But at the top layer, if you have a gizmo, and you've got a glucose meter or something, and you need to send that glucose reading somewhere, it doesn't make a lot of sense for that data to go to the doctor. It needs to go somewhere where work can be done on it and where we can do uh, you know, analytics, where we can compare it to a care plan and where we can get the right result back out to the patient or to the doctor or to the helper or to the neighbor. And that's what we call our software services layer. So let's shoot the next uh, video here and uh, we'll come back. There was a time when addressing the immediate needs of a patient took hours, sometimes days, compromising the care of the patient. That time has come to an end. Now, caregivers can proactively address patient needs by having the power to connect through virtual visits while accessing critical patient data. Now is the time for healthcare at its best. There was also a time when medical systems were disparate and data was not readily available, hindering the care for patients. And now, by using Verizon networks and advanced identity management platforms and exchanges, communication between caregivers can be streamlined and patient records can be kept current across the board so doctors and nurses can collaborate, focusing on coordinated care versus tracking down patient information. So let me just talk for a moment about identity. Uh, you know, it's one of these words that sort of doesn't mean a lot until you net it down. How many of you are happy with the fact that you have 70 or 80 different passwords for, you know, a couple of hundred different accounts? How many of you have gone to a place and not even known what your user ID is? I'll tell you right now that my name is Peter Tippett, and there is an account on Google called P. Tippett but I've never logged into it in the last four and a half years because four and a half years ago, I lost my password and never got it back. <laughs> I wound up creating a new account. <laughs> I'll never see that account again. I think most of us have these stories, right? Does anybody wonder why we bother with user identities? Why wouldn't you just say Peter Tippett when you want to log in? Why wouldn't you just tell whoever it is who you are? What's, what's pstippet99 at gmail.com got to do with you? That's an aberration. So Verizon runs these identity programs for a lot of, a lot of the world. We have uh, several hundred million people under management for identity. And to the extent that we can reduce the cost and make it easier, we now have an identity ecosystem in place that this slide is trying to show, where on the left side we can, do, uh, we can help figure out who the person really is with a bunch of different things we call form factors. Not sending them something and forcing them to use it, but accepting whatever they have. So for example, if my mother has a phone that's rotary dial, I don't know if anybody has those anymore, but if all she has is a plain old phone in her house and I need to really, really, really make sure that that's really her, why wouldn't I make that phone ring 
and ask her, right? Uh, why don't I figure out the geolocation of your cell phone and compare it with the geolocation of the PC that you're logging in on? And if that happens to be by the geolocation of your car, uh, maybe I can reduce the likelihood that that's somebody else, right? Uh, you know, pins and other things. So on the, on the user side, we need to get stronger identity, but we need to make a bunch of it invisible. We need to make it possible for, for people to log into things with things like their name or use one user ID to log into a different account and kind of remove the issue from the marketplace of, of identity being an inhibitor. So we've built a system. It's in production now. It can handle 150 million concurrent users. It's got uh, multiple uh, redundancy. And among the first applications we put on this was an e-prescribing application that will work with essentially any EMR. Uh, and what it does is, it, you know, when I was a doctor, it's been a little while, I used to walk on rounds, and I'd say, discharge this patient, Betty Boop, give her a prescription for uh, Dilaudid, give her some Lasix right now, get an MRI before she goes and have her see me in two weeks. And then I'd walk to the next patient on rounds with a whole bunch of people around me, and four or five minutes later, somebody would give me a clipboard, and I'd sign off on those orders. Nowadays, if I did that, somebody is always assigned on every ward to be the big burly person that gets the doctors in line, right? Some big burly person would come up to me and kind of steer me over to a chair and say, the computer is right here. Here's where CPOE is. Here's where e-prescribing is. Here's where the discharge stuff goes. Here's where this other stuff goes. And five or ten minutes later, I'd get back up and go. One of the stats on that number slide was that doctors pretty much still hate EMRs. They're tolerating and they love the lookup part, but they hate the data entry part, right? So why wouldn't I make it so the doctor can do what I just did? Just say those things. Have a clerk, somebody that's paid you know, minimum wage or double minimum wage, but not $500 an hour, take that stuff and enter it into the systems. And then have the phone on the doctor's hip go off and have the doctor pick up the phone, that's one factor of authentication, log into the phone, that's two factors of authentication, look at the prescription, the discharge, the CPOE, whatever, and clicks yes, 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 and put the phone back. That's the clipboard. That's in production now. It's certified for Schedule II drugs. It's operational at NIST Level 3. It works for all levels of, of, of uh, things that need to integrate with us, and it gets doctors those eight or ten minutes back. Doctors hate the productivity hit of a lot of the things we brought on. And to the extent that we can use strong identity and bring it back together, that seems to be valuable for us. But the same thing is true for helping all the HIEs and EMRs and things disintermediate the, the problem of which patient is which. So we've got a lot of identity capability there that we think can be helpful. So imagine I've got a gizmo, and I'm going to show you a couple of gizmos here in a second. I've got a gizmo, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and the gizmo pumps out glucose values. And imagine that uh, I've, I, I, I'm a gizmo maker, uh, and I, I want to worry about if I'm going to send that data to a hospital or a, a physician or an uh, insurance company or somebody, I have to do all the HIPAA work, including signing the business associate agreements and whatnot. Use my exchange. I'll deal with all that, the majority of that uh, for you. So, so the data goes through an exchange. It winds up somewhere. Should it really wind up at uh, the doctor's office? Does that make any sense? A doctor with 1,000 diabetics want to see you know, 4,000 glucose readings every day? No, it should wind up in a platform that can do the analytics, that can compare it to a care plan, that can see whether things are getting out of hand, that can tell the right things to the right people, that can get this stuff organized in a way that can actually change behavior. Uh, so imagine if I have identity, but not only identity, but attributes. And imagine if I have a platform and uh, you know, we, we're in the middle of, uh, of, of, of building this thing in a way that we think is going to be truly valuable because it's available to everybody. It works with all kinds of gizmos. It works with anybody uh, 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 system. And if we, if we wind up making this platform so that the data gets up there, and if you need analytics, I'll give it to you. If you need a care plan manager, I'll give it to you. If you need a way to make the alert go to the right person, I'll give it to you. In our identity ecosystem, my mother has a neighbor who uh, is also 85 who has 1,000 televisions in her house. If you want that neighbor to know that my mother's in trouble, putting a message on the television would be a good thing to do. Her other friend has a rotary dial phone. 
if she needs to know that something's going on, having her phone ring would be the way to do it. If she wants her son to know what's going on, I prefer email, but my sister prefers SMS. But how do we know which ones are okay HIPAA-wise to, to share medical information with? That's the sort of stuff we keep in the attributes section of our identity ecosystem on behalf of each patient. So suppose a message gets up that the glucose is here or the weight is going out of a range and, uh, and a CHF patient is starting to get, uh, you know, starting to go off the deep end. Instead of calling on Thursday, every Thursday like we do now, have that intervention happen earlier. But wouldn't it be better, that, I mean, it's good to have the nurse learn and call early, but wouldn't it be even nicer to, to create a way that the actual social network of my mother, the neighbor across the street, the one down the road, her son and daughter, get the message as well? And one of them walks over and says, Phyllis, did you take your Lasix? You know, can I help you with this? Let me do that with that. So making these various platforms tie together in a way that, that, that makes the social networking work work is really cool. And this, this uh, Converge Health Management system that we've got coming online, we think will really tie that all together, and we think it will help raise all boats. I've got a bunch of gizmos here. This is a show that includes uh, a lot of gizmo discussion. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, give you a couple of examples here. Uh, this is, a, uh, uh, this is an EKG, and uh, it's kind of nice. You can hook up the wires and, uh, and remotely uh, send your EKG data via, via the Verizon network. Uh, I like this one better. This is an EEG and uh, does all the things that a sleep study needs to do, um, but all the data winds up going over, uh, over the Verizon network on its way. So you can do your sleep study at home. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of uh, gizmos out there. This is uh, a, a company that uh, uh, you know, this, when, you, when you get a glucose uh, tester at the pharmacy, it turns out it has a little plug in the bottom. And it turns out that the plug in the bottom uh, is pretty much on all of them. Uh, and so we've got a, uh, there's some little gizmos here that, that have a wire that plug into that plug and all of a sudden you take a plain old glucose meter and make it into something that connects over the, over the network and gets the data where, where it needs to go. Somebody took my wire here, but that would have been the key part of the demo. <laughs> Just a key part. Uh, this is a Nantlife HVOX for help. Uh, and uh, this thing, if you, uh, you know, if you want, and I think it make, a lot of us make a big mistake in thinking that people actually care about all these values. You know, I, I tested this stuff on my mom and a bunch of seniors. Uh, my my uh, uncle flew B-17 uh, B B bombers in World War II, so he had a reunion a couple of weeks ago. And they weren't, uh, they weren't interested in looking at all this stuff. They're happy to step on a scale, you know, if it's part of their natural uh, thing. But, but uh, most of them aren't interested in looking at the app that also comes with it. So this is an app in a box. You plug this in the wall, and instead of asking the patient to look at it and figure it out, you manage this thing remotely, and, uh, and it backhauls the data over the cellular network or over the, uh, the network that's in the house or over any of the Zigbee or any of the rest of those sorts of things. There's a gizmo you can stick in your ear. Everybody says stick it. So we make something you could stick in your ear there. This one's from uh, Nant Life. So the question isn't whether the gizmo is important or not. We're going to, many of these gizmos will indeed help transform this. But the question is, once the data goes somewhere, and, and uh, what are we going to do with it? In Verizon, our whole goal is, to, the, the, everything I showed you today works on the Verizon network that I just showed you now. But, you know, it turns out that every now and again, people don't use the Verizon network. I can't understand it, but it, it happens. I think I want to raise at Verizon, we want to make it so that this stuff works even if you're on somebody else's network, even if you're using Bluetooth, or even if you're using your home, uh, you know, if your home network. And so we've done a deal with the Continua uh, uh, Health Alliance that makes it so that this platform I'm describing, whether it's the identity platform or the exchange platform or the M Health disease management, uh, you know, sort of uh, functionality or telemedicine platforms, all of those things uh, can support the devices even if they are 
uh, if, as long as they're certified by some organization and operate like Continua. Now, I've told you a little bit about things that we've built, and we're kind of proud of this because a lot of times telephone companies get up and say what things we're reselling, what things of other people's that we're bringing to you to use our network. We're rising above that and trying to actually provide some glue that removes some impediments like uh, compliance and so on. But we also need to help drive real change in the whole healthcare ecosystem. And so we've made some partnerships in the most recent year that we think are really, really going to help drive this change. Uh, we've worked with Duke about, uh, about uh, building plans to figure out the, the personal economics and driving uh, people and behavioral change, and they're doing a lot of work there. ICSA Labs is actually a division of Verizon, uh, but it's an independent division that does certification testing and security and privacy. It's one of the oldest organizations that does that. Uh, it's recently, in the past four or five years, done the kind of uh, work to do certification even in hospitals of meaningful use. But lately, ICSA has also uh, uh, run some programs that can certify all these devices, can check for and test for and force interoperability testing, and can, and can deal with the, uh, the very complex mixture of, of compliance requirements, including our own at ICSA, on, on how to make that work. Health Evolution Partners, giant investor uh, in, in the health uh, system. We've got lots of work going there to help drive that innovation through other people's organizations. I was down at the Clinton Foundation a couple of weeks ago, and we announced the Health Matters Initiative. This is uh, Clinton's uh, uh, ability to try and drive uh, try and raise all boats by sort of giving people, teaching people how to fish and providing those, those uh, toolkits so that they can be replicated. And uh, we're going to be driving the vast majority of uh, the technical activity and trying uh, uh, getting some of these centers set up and, and moving. And of course, we have our own innovation centers. Uh, we've got an uh, innovation center that uh, in, in Waltham, Massachusetts, one out in San Francisco, and then we've got the innovation incubator all that are organized to drive all of your folks and the folks uh, that are supporting you folks to get the new stuff going. Verizon Ventures uh, was busy this year. We've invested in six or seven uh, companies, uh, all in the healthcare space. These are all early or mid-stage uh, companies in the space. Uh, and you know, I won't go into these things just to say that, that you know, Verizon is all in on this healthcare thing. It's, it's not about us. Uh, trying to get people to use our network, and that's the end of the game. We really want to get involved in a serious way and, uh, and drive all this. We have a concept in Verizon that we call shared success. And shared success, in the old days, you know, a big company would go buy a couple of cartons or a couple of uh, uh, truckloads of vaccine and, and get them off to uh, Bangladesh somewhere and get a video crew and, and say, aren't we great, we're helping society. Shared success means something different. Shared success means doing the things in Verizon that actually change society, that actually drive that change, that actually raise all boats, that actually help drive the kinds of change that we know will help all of us be successful in a, in a shared way. And one of our partners on that is the Verizon Foundation. If you go to the uh, trade show floor, you'll see both a Verizon booth and a Verizon Foundation booth. And the Verizon Foundation is a wonderful organization driving care around uh, women's issues, children's issues, and uh, elderly. And we've got uh, a, a children's health fund uh, 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 bus there that uh, operates in 25 uh, markets around to bring care directly to underserved uh, 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 kids. That's also used for emergency response and other things. We've got a lot of activity going that helps drive that. So. At Verizon, we are interested in driving, helping drive, and, and helping really uh, grease the skids on all of you driving the transformation that we know is coming in healthcare. Healthcare is going to change just like the PC revolution changed everything else. It, I can't be sure that I'm going to tell you exactly what it's going to look like in five or 10 years or 20 years, but I do know that if we remove the impediments, like the compliance impediments, like the connectivity impediments, like the ability to actually share information, it seems easy. But to the extent that it, I mean, it isn't easy. Uh, the ability to do the sort of compute on behalf of, the ability to get that, the cloud computing, the other modern kinds of IT services operating in our ecosystem. You know, we have 95 million users of our cell phones in America. And we could put a number that says 95 million on this slide, and that would be a nice number. 
But we're not just interested in helping the 95 million. We're interested in helping everybody in America transform to the new healthcare ecosystem and make it all work for all of us. Let's play the last video and thank you. Thanks a lot, everybody.